Good morning, everyone. My name is Dereem Hoff, and I'm the Kids and Women's Minister here at our Savior Lutheran Church. I want to welcome all those gathered in person at our Tacoma campus this morning, as well as those joining us online. We invite everyone to complete a connection card, either by using your phone to scan the QR code that you see on your screen, or by going to go.oslc.com cc. If you're in person, you can grab a connection card from the pew in front of you, fill it out, and put it in the giving boxes at the back as you leave worship today. Today. If this is your first time worshiping with us today, let us know on your connection card or stop by the connection counter in the lobby after worship because we have a gift for you. Here's what's happening in OSLC life. In case you haven't heard, OSLC's VBS Stellar registration is open so you can register your three-year-old through fourth grader at oslc.com slash VBS. It's going to be an incredible week as we go galactic to discover what it means to shine Jesus' light and explore how Jesus shines hope, love, forgiveness, and joy to the world. We need about 20 more youth and adult volunteers, so if you're willing to be part of our team, register yourself at oslc.com slash VBS. BBS, and thank you for your support of Vacation Bible School. As we get ready to enter our time of worship, I want to let you know that if you want more information on all the other exciting ministries happening at Our Savior, check out our central hub at oslc.com or download the OSLC app at oslc.com app. Amen. Can we just thank God for those who have gone before us, secured our freedom, and uh, it is a special day. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you in-house here, and hello online. Glad you all are with us as well. Your hosts are there. They're going to walk you through the service, and uh, it's a great time to join together in God's house as we stand as one body wherever we are. How many of you at the end of the video are like, oh, I'm supposed to stand up? Oh, I'm not standing up. Uh, but we are glad that you are, have chosen to join us on this very special day, Pentecost. We're also welcoming new members today and, of course, celebrating Memorial Day. So we serve a God who also gave his life for our freedom. Amen. 
And uh, that is the God that we serve. He is great. He is mighty and wonderful. And we praise Him today as we begin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's sing together. everyone. You may be seated. God really is a great God. And as a uh, someone who has moved to Washington State in the last few years, I've become to realize how beautiful our state are. 
excuse me, our state is. It's a Sunday. But we live in a wonderful and a beautiful state. And many of you realize this. We love the outdoors. And this song reminds us that in the outdoors, we feel close to God. Maybe for you it's at the ocean or in the mountains or the sound of the wind in the trees. All of creation speaks to the greatness of God. Romans 1.20 reminds us that since the beginning of creation, what God has created speaks to his attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature. And so as we prepare for our time of confession today, let us continue that testimony. Continue that speaking to the greatness of God as a part of God's creation. God formed us with his hands. He knit us in our mother's womb. And we can speak to the greatness of God for everything he has done. But even also, when we realize that, we realize how short we come in comparison to him. How much we need a good and great God. So please join me in a time of silent confession as we think about the ways that we need this great God. So Lord, we pray that you would forgive us and renew us, lead us, so that we may have joy, not just today, but every day that we have to spend with you in your great creation. We thank you for loving us, for dying on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Memorial Day weekend. I'm Pastor Tim, and it's good to welcome you here. And it's my joy to announce to you the grace of God is for you, no matter who you are, what sort of morning you've had, what sort of year you've had, or what sort of life you've had up until today, that you are loved and forgiven because Jesus Christ himself has come to live, to die for you. And he has forgiven all of your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. You know, it's not just in nature where God says that you can find him and in creation, but it's right here at this table with the bread and the wine. He's promised to be right here with you. And so as we share communion, know that God is here with you in spirit and in truth. The invitation for you today is that Jesus, it's his meal, so he says, come. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples as he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. He is risen. And he will come again. If you believe that, say amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. We get to come forward today to receive communion. If you're here in the room, if you're online, you can participate wherever you are with some bread, some wine, some grape juice. And it is a time of worship, so you'll come forward. We'll have four stations. The first person you'll find is holding a, a plate of bread, and all of our bread is gluten-free. And then the second person will have a tray of wine, all right? The outer circle of darker color cups, that's alcoholic wine. And in the center of every tray is non-alcoholic wine, grape juice, all right? And you can choose your cup on, based on your preference and consume that bread and wine right away. And then there's baskets here where you can place that empty cup on your way back to where you're seated, all right? 
Hey, if you're new with us, um, it might be a little different for you. Um, we, we invite kids to participate in this time of worship. And whether they're receiving communion, which we instruct kids beginning in around fifth grade, or if they're younger than fifth grade and haven't had that instruction yet, we want them to come up with you. And if you're looking just for some ways to have your entire family, children and all uh, connected and worshiping with you as a family today, there's a yellow card right there in front of you. You can grab that. There's a couple bullet points to help guide your worship time today. So our servers are ready to serve. So as they come forward, we're going to commune together. And Jared and the band, you guys will lead us in singing. All right.
together as we sing. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. today, God, we want to be aware of what you're doing in this room, Lord, we want to be aware of what you're doing in our lives, and God, so we do ask that you continue to pour your spirit on us, God, make us aware of your presence, help us to tune out those things that distract us, God, but remind us of how amazing, and marvelous, and wonderful you are, because of what you've done for us on the cross.
please join me as we speak the words of our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Baby Stephen. Please join me as we continue in a time of prayer. God, we are so grateful for who you are. We're thankful for the privilege it is to come before you in your presence in the name of Jesus. Grateful that we have the opportunity to worship you freely, to read your word, to, to pray to you, to share the gospel with others, God. We pray for those people around the globe who do not have those same freedoms and privileges. We pray that you would protect them as you protect us. And we pray that you would make them brave and bold and courageous like you do the same for us as well. God, we thank you for the men and women who have sacrificed so much for this country and for us individually this Memorial Day weekend. We thank you for using people like them to protect this nation, to serve people, Lord. God, we pray that you would be with everybody as we remember them this weekend. God, ultimately, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. You too offer freedom. God, help us to live in that freedom today and this week. God, help us to remember that freedom and help us to share that freedom with others. You promise that it is by faith we are saved. So we proclaim that faith in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Carrie. Good morning, everybody again. Good morning, good morning. Hey, I want to invite our new member families to make their way forward. And as they're doing that, everyone else, I want to invite you to take a moment to take this connection card out. Let us know you're here. Maybe you came in a little late. And uh, this is what we do. We share prayer requests here, all right? We share prayer requests. And on the back of this card, you can share a prayer request. You can write it down, place it in one of the boxes in the back. If you came with an offering today, you can place your offering in one of those boxes as well. If you're online, there's a link that's popping up right now in the chat area. You can click on that link or simply go to our website, oslc.com. Click on the icon that says Sunday morning links, and that will lead you to an online connection card and prayer request space, all right? Uh, we do pray over those prayers each and every week. As a staff, we have a dedicated day when we focus in on that. And then our leaders, our board, our elders also have an opportunity to join us in prayer throughout the week over all of that. So uh, we know that prayer is a good thing. And we've been praying for you folks here for quite some time because we oftentimes pray that God would lead people to gather as his family, not to grow a big church or to have a big church, but because we know that the love of God moves in people's lives and it transforms their lives. It changes how we think, how we act. And that's what we would say part of what it means to love God, love people, and live like Jesus. To be open to the change that God has, not just personally, but 
in the world around us. And uh, Christy, our director of outreach and connections, and then Shelly over here, uh, you'll She's not the coffee gal, all right? She's not the coffee gal. But she does uh, work with our frontline hospitality teams. But she's our minister of outreach and connections. You've been working with this group now for several weeks. And why don't you share a little bit about where they've been, where they're going, and all that great stuff. Sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, good morning. Shelly and I have had the honor and the privilege of meeting with this group of people over the last five or six weeks or so, and just as we believe that God created this area, in, like Carrie was saying earlier, in a unique and beautiful way, we believe that he has created the people here at Our Savior in a unique and beautiful way. And so we got to spend some time hearing stories, learning their background, uh, discussing what it means to be a part of this church from a Lutheran perspective, uh, discussing our faith, discussing the Bible, and finding out how we can all grow together as a faith family. God has all of us here for a reason, and so we wanna love and serve each other well and love and serve our community well. So this group of people, we are grateful to welcome them into our faith family, and I'd love it if you would join me this morning in um, saying good morning and welcoming them into our Savior Lutheran Church. Awesome, awesome. So I have a question because it's always good to hear it from your heart. Is it your desire to be members, body of Christ members, connected to the family here at Our Savior, to love God, love people, and live like Jesus together? If that is your desire, say, we will with the help of God. And it's good for them to hear your voice too. Do you receive them as family members, like brothers and sisters, adopted family, to love for them, to support them, to pray for them, and to encourage them as we love God, love people, and live like Jesus together? If so, say, we will with the help of God. We will. With the help of God. That's pretty cool, huh? Hey, welcome to the family. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are glad that you're here. Hey, let's welcome them again. Thank God for... Bringing folks together, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Awesome. Hey, um, there's some gifts for you, I think, in the back. And hey, maybe you're interested in taking your next step to learn more about who Jesus is, uh, take that next step of faith, say, hey, what, what's the membership thing all about? What does it mean to be part of a church and all that? Maybe you've been burned by the church, all right? We, we know that happens. Uh, there's a lot of church trauma out there. Hey, we want to walk with you through that because we believe the best way to follow Jesus is never alone always together. And so the next new member uh, session or process begins in the fall, correct? So uh, be looking for that, all right? Sometime October, I believe, October. So uh, check the website. We'll be talking about that as we move into the fall, all right? Hey, you guys can head on back to your seat, and as they're doing that, let's check out our kids' message as we move into our message time today, all right? Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Besteman, and I'm here as an elder at Our Savior, and I want to welcome you to this week's kids' message. We all have questions, right? Like, what's for dinner? Why do I have to clean my room? When is recess? And what am I gonna do at recess? I have lots of my own questions too, like, why do I have to clean the house? When do I get to go on vacation? And what am I going to do? Sometimes we also have questions about Jesus. Who is he? Does he love me? Will he always be with me? Does he forgive me? In today's Bible verses, we discover a Jesus follower named Philip. An angel told Philip to travel toward a desert. On the way, Philip met an Ethiopian who was reading the Jewish scripture. This man had questions, and he asked Philip to help him understand. Philip answered the man's questions and pointed him to Jesus. The man put his faith in Jesus and was baptized. Just like the Ethiopian man, we can ask questions about our faith in God. Who can we ask to help us with our questions? First, we can always go to God in prayer, and we can always ask someone here at church, our Kids Connect teachers, our moms, our dads, to help us. It's okay to have questions. Our bottom line for today is, God is with you even when you have questions. Let's pray. You can repeat after me. 
Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to save us from our sins. We'll never know everything there is to know about you. Sometimes we have to ask questions. We are thankful for this church, which is full of people ready to help us. In Jesus' name, amen. For more Bible fun, videos on today's lesson, and conversation starters for your family, head to the section called Kids Connect at Home in today's Kids News email. There's no Kids Connect today, so put on your listening ears to hear the message God has for you in today's sermon. Have a great week, everyone. Our Bible reading this morning is from the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 to 30. It's found on page 120 of your pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. We read, So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he had gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad, the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all of the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of the Israel returned to the camp. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what do you call numbers that are always on the move? Roman numerals. (laughs) Ah. That's not what the book of Numbers is about. (laughs) You know, uh, the book of Numbers, it's an interesting book. And before we go there, I just want to point out, we have these handouts. Uh, We just welcomed in some new family members uh, to our Savior family. You can learn a little bit more about them, their their pretty faces and their their contact information and all that. We're not going to post it online, all right? So if you would like like one of these, all right, and you are primarily online, uh, just send us an email just through the website and um, we'll figure out a way to get that to you, all right? Cool. Um, No, Numbers is not about Roman (laughs) numerals at all. Um, Numbers is actually an interesting book. There there are a lot of numbers, but it's, it's sort of describing what has happened now that God's people, they, they found freedom. They're, they're living God's, God's way, not their way, but God's way. But if you fast forward many, many, many years, thousands of years, you find people, God's people, and they were in a situation, a really tough situation, when they were out of options. Anybody been there? You, like, you're in a situation, you're out of options? Nobody, a couple folks, okay, all right. Everybody online is popping up, they're like, uh-huh, yeah. so, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but these were Jesus' friends. These, these were people who, who knew God, who loved Jesus, and they felt like they were out of options, which means that, that as Jesus followers, it's okay to, to feel that way. It's okay to feel like you're out of options. And for these particular folks, they were scared. They were so scared that, that they were hiding, They're hiding in an upper room of house because they were waiting, but they didn't know what they were necessarily waiting for. And all around them, as they were looking out their windows, people from all over the world known at that time were were coming into town from the north to the south to the east to the west, and, and they were coming in for, in a sense, a big Thanksgiving celebration. 
Not with turkey and mashed potatoes and corn and green beans and all the other healthy stuff that we eat around Thanksgiving time here in the United States, but, but this was a Thanksgiving for the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest. Because their livelihoods would have depended on this harvest. And, and after they would have gathered all the wheat, they would have had it. They would have put some in storage. They would have taken some and set it aside for themselves. They would have had some that they would take to market. They would take, they would take the best of it, the very first of best, and bring it to this Thanksgiving festival. They would use some of it to make bread for everybody to eat. But then they would offer the rest as a sacrifice, as a way to say thank you. It was actually called a feast day, or not just like a table feast, but a celebration, a festival called Shavuot. Everybody say that word with me. Shavuot. And it was a joy-filled celebration. Now, now remember, everybody else is coming together. They, they were filled with joy and expectation. And they were happy to see their family and friends all gather around. But remember, these people now were in their rooms. They were scared. They were hiding. They were waiting and they were scared and they were hiding and they were waiting because their best friend jesus had left them they thought that they were left alone and the most important people were after them they didn't know what was going to happen because jesus gave them a job to do and they had no idea what to do and how to do it so they were waiting scared and hiding they didn't know what to do. Do you know what happens next? God shows up. Have you ever had one of those moments where you didn't know what to do and then God shows up and surprises you? God shows up and and just to summarize it, uh, Peter, you know, remember Peter who denies Jesus and Peter who, who puts his foot in his mouth one too many times. Peter, the fisherman who probably smelled like trout all day, every day. Yeah, that, that, that Peter. He, he preaches a simple sermon, a simple story about Jesus. And people came to know Jesus. They connected the dots about who Jesus was, that he was the savior of the world. That he was a savior for, for every person from their sin. And that he would never leave them, even though physically he was not with them anymore. But now that, that he's gone, we have his spirit. God shows up. This is how Sally Lloyd-Jones puts it in her Jesus Storybook Bible. She says, how it happened, nobody knows. They didn't know. But they knew God's power had struck their hearts ablaze. Why? Because Jesus himself was coming to live where? Inside of them. Did you know that? That Jesus lives inside of you? It's true. Even when you're afraid. Even when you're hiding. Even when you're waiting. Where does Jesus live? He lives inside of you. And as I said, this is what happens next. Many people, they believed, and they became Jesus' new friends and helpers, she says. And the wonderful news of Jesus spread, like sparks from a fire, to villages, to towns, to cities. Every day, more and more people believed. And so it was that the family of God's children, his special people, they did what? They, they grew. They grew. Now, 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 now remember, they're, they're all there for this feast called, anybody Remember? Shavuot, right? Shavuot. And, and, and they would be waving these big stalks of grain from the north to the south to the east to the west as a way to, to parade in to say, God, thank you for, for giving us food and a job and everything we have and for family. But see what God just did? <laughs> Instead of waving wheat, God shows up and now he's waving people as they go home to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west to, to share God's incredible love for them and what he's done. Another part of Shavuot was that, that they gathered together and they would remember the Ten Commandments. And, 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 and as they re remember the Ten Commandments, uh, it was actually 50 days after they were released from Egypt and the Passover. And, and so, so it was like 
50 days after Easter when Jesus released us from sin and death, that God gives us, in a sense, a new law, a new set of commands. A new command to love. A new command that I will never leave you, and, and that's how you are invited to live as the presence of God in the world. You're now set free. And if you really, really, really look at that story back in, in the Exodus and, and then again in Deuteronomy, you, you see that when, remember when Moses comes down and he has the two tablets, all right, might be look like Charlton Heston a little bit. Remember what he saw? A golden cow, right? It's an idol. Uh, it was actually Aaron, uh, his, his co-pastor in a way, who, who helped them build this golden cow because they were waiting and waiting and they were scared. They didn't know what was going to go next, so they took matters into their own hands. And, and if you're familiar with the story, because of that, because they took matters into their own hands, 3,000 people died because they worshipped a golden calf. But now instead of 3,000 people dying for worshiping a golden calf, now 3,000 people are living because they come to faith in Jesus. You see the total reversal when God shows up? You see the life change that happens, not just in individuals' lives, but in the life of the world when God shows up even with people who are out of options. Because while the disciples, they felt like they were out of options, God chose to use his only option, people and his spirit, and it works. Because this is what we learn in today's, in today's story from the book of Numbers. God's mission, his heart, his desire to get his world and his people back, it has a what? It has a church. Not a building, not lights, not projection systems. But he has people. You're the church. I'm the church. People are the church. I like what John Stott says. He's a commentator, a really smart guy, theologian. And, and check this out. This is what he says. The church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. Not just, not just the purpose of God today, but the eternal purpose from the beginning of time to the end of time and even beyond the beginning and the end. If you can wrap your mind around that, that's what it means to be eternal. There is no time. There is no beginning, no end. This was God's plan A and there is no plan B. The church lies at the very center of it. Why? Because the church is God's new what? Community. It's God's new way of, of being in relationship with people. It's God's new way of, of showing himself to the world. Remember, God, God has, has three parts, three expressions, three different persons in who he is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, we express that every time we say the creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. That, that's what he's talking about, the community, the, the community of not just the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who God is. But he says, I want that sort of relationship with you. I want that sort of relationship with the world. I want that sort of relationship with everyone, and I'm going to call it the church. I'm going to call it the church. And it's something that God's been doing for thousands and thousands of years, which brings us to the story in Numbers. Thousands of years before God shows up with his Holy Spirit at the time of Pentecost, at that Feast of Shavuot. Thousands of years before that, people, they were out of options too. And they were going to take matters into their own hands. They had just come out of Egypt. They were going through the desert. They were hot. They were, they were sweaty. They were stinky. They were sleeping out in the middle of the desert underneath the stars and and they would have what they called manna, which was this, this flaky biscuit-like bread and and quail to eat, uh, which were, were like little birds, all right? I'm sure they taste like chicken because that's what all birds kind of taste like, right? So they had manna and quail, but, but they were tired of eating the same thing every day. Kids, it's like eating peanut butter and jelly every day. Would you get tired of that? Or like, my, <laughs> did you hear that? That's right. Or my kids, all right, right? They're like, ham sandwiches again? And they were complaining. They're complaining about God's provision of food in this desert because they were waiting. They didn't know where they were going. They, God just said, follow me, and they were following him. And they said, we're tired of this. 
We're done with this. We're scared. We're waiting. It feels like we're hiding in a desert with food we don't like to eat. And while they were complaining, what was God up to? God was up to promising. He pointed out, hey, remember, I'm with you. Do you see the light in the sky? I'm still with you. Do you see the cloud over here? I'm still with you. I'm still guiding you. I'm still leading you. I'm still with you. We, we, we remember, remember the food? I, I, I know it's the same thing every day, but you got to trust me, guys. I'm here for you. I've got your back. Haven't left you. And isn't that the same way that we go about life today? <laughs> well, you and I, we may find ourselves complaining. What's God up to? Promising. And so this is what happens. God, God, while his people were complaining, he's promising, he's saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to show you that I'm not gone, that in your waiting, in your hiding, in your worrying, in your complaining, I'm going to give you leaders. I'm going to give you people who represent me. And so he call, calls out everyone. Um, he he kind of gives parameters and, and qualifications, if you will. And, and they're all outside the tent. And, and if you remember the story, the Holy Spirit falls on them and they begin prophesying, telling the truth. You can think about it like that. Uh, they're speaking the truth in love and, and yet directly. And they're forth-telling, not maybe necessarily foretelling. They're not like fortune tellers, tarot card people. That would be witchcraft, by the way. But they were forth-telling. That's what it means to prophesy. And that's in a way how, how they knew that, that these folks were touched by the Holy Spirit. That, like they were able to foretell a truth that they wouldn't ordinarily know. And that's how they knew God was with them. Well, there were these two people, Eldad and Medad, who, who were in the village, and they come, come running out, and they're like, hey, 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 me too, me too. Any, anybody else like that sometimes? Like, hey, I missed the memo. Like, <laughs> and everyone's like, hey, uh, these guys are late to the party, and what, 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 what do you mean? Like, you, you can probably, no, 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 you can't, you don't belong here. You didn't make it in time. You, you, missed, you missed the mark. You missed the qualification. <laughs> and what Moses says to their complaining echoes God's promise. He says, are you jealous? He says, I wish everyone, everyone had the, had the presence of God in them to prophesy, to forth tell, to truth tell. Because that's how we would know that God is with us. Because he knew when, when, when people feel like they're out of options, God continues to use his only option, people and his Holy Spirit brought together, and it works. And then you fast forward several thousand years, and that's exactly what God does. It's not just a few collected people. It's not just the dudes. It's men and women children and infants, all people who have a relationship with God. God. God wants that relationship with you and me today. That's why we call it the church, because we're in relationship with God. We're in relationship with one another, and when it all comes together, it's not just the Feast of Shavuot saying, thanks, God. It's not just, just the wandering in the desert experience and just blindly following Jesus, which is a good thing, but God says, no, I'm going to give you something something that you can experience. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. And you're going to echo my promises in the middle of your complaining. That as the world around you, you hear the, the utterances and the complaints and all the really not so nice and good stuff around. You're going to speak the truth in love. That I'm still here. I've never left you. 
that I still love you. And, and, and that family, he says, is going to grow because I want my world back. Remember, God's mission of getting his world, his people back, it has a church, it has you and me. It's always been when we're out of options, God's plan A, people and his spirit brought together so that the world may know who Jesus is. So as we wrap up, just a couple observations of, of how this works and how we can participate in it. Uh, the first is this, uh, we stop and breathe, all right? Uh, the word for spirit, Holy Spirit, uh, ruach, all right, it, it's literally the breath of God. And, and sometimes we get so busy, we get so caught up in trying to, to figure things out on our own way, just like the people in, in the wilderness with the man and quail, they, they wanted to take matters into their own hands, or at the, the base of Mount Sinai, they took matters in their own hands because they were tired, they were waiting, they were afraid, they felt like they were hiding, so they built a golden calf. We too get that way, we get so impatient, and so God's invitation and say, hey, remember my plan A. It's always people and my spirit coming together, so just stop and let my spirit be your breath. When was the last time you just took in God's word and let it echo through your voice? I do this sometimes in my own devotion time. Um, I'll read it with my eyes, boys and girls, you know what I mean when I say read with my eyes? But then I say it out loud. Not because I have to, but it's a way I practice stopping and letting God's breath, his spirit flow out of his word, right out of my mouth through my vocal cords. And maybe this Memorial Day weekend as you're stopping and breathing from work, if you have the luxury and the privilege to do that, I know there's a lot of folks who don't get a day off, but if you do have the luxury and privilege to have a day off, remember to stop and breathe. Second is this, nothing is normal when it comes to God. Would you agree? Hey, nothing is normal. I, I, I love what Michelle Reyes, she wrote the book, Becoming All Things. Um, she talks about um, just the normality, the, the abnormality and the normality, all right? And this is what, what she says in her book, Becoming All Things. She says this, if we want to begin the hard work of forming real cross-cultural friendships, that relationships across cultures, and, and that's with other people, with, with other, other experiences, with different perspectives, and because that's exactly what God does for us, right? We do not have a God culture within us. God had to cross that culture boundary into our hearts, all right? And so we do the same thing with others. So if we want to do that, if we want to practice that same action of God in which we don't make everything about ourselves, right? This is what she says and encourages we have to do. We have to break out of our own routines, comfort zones, and monocultural spaces. That would be everything has to be like me, talks like me, acts like me, because I'm the only fish in the sea, be so empty without me. My 90s people, yep. <laughs> Monocultural spaces to explore uncharted ter territories. When did you think that you could hear an Eminem quote in church? Come on. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> but this is exactly what Eldad and Medad is all about, right? This is what, what Pentecost is all about. Unlikely people, cross-cultural relationships, God coming into a different world in a different place, breaking out of our comfort zones, his comfort zones, his routine, and doing things that is, are not normal. Why? So that, that we can have the friendships of God. So that we can have the friendship with each other. Nothing is normal when it comes to God showing up. Here's the third thing. We can listen to stories. We can listen to stories. Uh, there's a lot of difference between listening and hearing. That's what G.K. Chesterton says. There's a lot of difference between listening and hearing. And you probably agree. Because we can hear a lot of things. We call them echo chambers, right? When we hear the same thing over and over and over, all right, I was listening to a TED Talk, and, and this is what the, the speaker was saying uh, about, about listening and hearing, all right? She says, show a people as one thing, and only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. So if you hear the story, same story over and over and over again, 
That's who you become. And on one hand, that's a good thing because when you hear the Jesus story again, over and over and over again, that's who we become, right? But when it becomes our own story, when it becomes the human story, when it becomes anything but God's story, uh, that's not so good. We end up like, like the people out in the desert or the, the disciples as they were hiding and scared and waiting. And, and so how do we get out of that? Well, we listen to the stories. This is how, how the quote continues, all right? Single stories create stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, right? But that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. So when we listen to stories, we, we strive to listen to other stories, other ways that God has shown up in other people's lives. While God might show up in healing in one person's life, they might show up in provision in another. And, and you might say, God, I, I don't feel like God's really shown up in provision, but I have the story of how God has shown up faithfully by, by preservation or, or, or by wisdom. And, and that's just how God works. Like God's story is not just one specific streamlined story outside of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is one streamlined story. But the way he expresses himself is through each of our stories and bringing that together, hearing those stories, we remove ourselves from those echo chambers because, because, because stories are mysteries to explore, not riddles to be solved. That's what Dr. Barnett Pierce says. That mystery directs our attention to the fact that the universe is far bigger and subtler than any possible set of stories that we may develop. So whatever we think, there's more to it than that. They're not riddles to be solved, but a mystery to explore. That's what the Jesus story is. When God shows up in your life, the story that you have to share, how God became known to you, how you became in relationship with God, that story, it is not meant to be a riddle to be solved, but a mystery to explore that you will explore till the day you see Jesus face to face. And you see the stories like, like me, Dad, and El Dad, they echo in the past, but they point the Jesus into the future. Because that's exactly what Jesus does. He comes seemingly last minute, but always seemingly on time and says, hey, 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 I'm the Savior of the world. I'm the Savior of the world. And they crucified him. Because he didn't match up to their expectations. But Jesus moves out of his comfort zone to save the world. Stories like Pentecost, which echo in the present and point to Jesus into our future. Stories like yours and mine that echo into the future to our kids and our grandkids and, and our great-grandkids. And yet, it all points to Jesus. Listen to other stories. Here's the last observation uh, piece that we can take away from the story in Numbers. Um, we can lean into discomfort. I'll share an example with you. Um, Earlier this month, we had an opportunity to sit down with some Franklin Pierce High School seniors, and they get to share their story, and, and it's not my story to share, but I was so blown away by one student who, who essentially said, I, I don't feel like I have anything to give. I'm an immigrant. I, I'm trilingual. I, I'm graduating high school. I'm the first one in my family to graduate, and and I'm going, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to continue my schooling. I have a job. And I'm thinking, you have nothing to give, huh? All right. But you might relate, right? You might have felt like you have nothing to give. Like you're all out of options. And you're waiting. And you're hiding. And you're scared. This is what we learned from the Eldad and me dad story. Lean into discomfort. I love what a staff writer on the blog Deep Spirituality says about this. Staff writer says, It's comforting to remember Jesus knew we would feel inadequate and never good enough. But that feeling of inadequacy also reveals where we're putting our trust. If it's in ourselves, we will never be good enough and always fearful of being known. But if we put our faith in God, our trust in God, there's no need to be afraid to be ourselves and not 
to be enough because God makes up for it in so many ways. Vulnerability becomes freeing and refreshing. And it's the only way, I would add, out of shame and fear. It'd be really easy to end this sermon with, hey, go be the church. But I'm not going to end it that way. Because I don't think we need another burden on our shoulders as we leave this place. And so this is how, how I want us to, to leave here. That the story about Eldad and Medad, the story about Pentecost and Shavuot and how God shows up. It's a story all about Jesus. That Jesus stopped and breathed his last breath so that you and I can have the breath of his Holy Spirit now and forever. That Jesus stepped outside of his comfort zone so that his confidence can become your confidence and your weakness, he can become strong. That Jesus listens to your story so that you and I, we can be reminded, even though we didn't think that Jesus might have been part of our story, he has always been part of our story in many and various ways. And as he hangs there on the cross, he literally leans forward into discomfort, physically, emotionally, in every way, because he feels like he's out of options as he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet God continues to use his own option, his only option, a human being with his Holy Spirit. And it works. I want to invite you to stand band's going to come up and we'll close out. I don't know who this message is for today, but I think sometimes we get so caught up in, oh, the church got to do this, church got to do that, and go do, 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 do. And it's great. It's great. Don't get me wrong. We are to be an active. Faith without works is dead, right? But the story of Pentecost isn't go and do. <laughs> The story of Pentecost is that Jesus has come and done. And so let's pray. Uh, as we leave this place, God, uh, Lord, would you instill in us that you are the one who worked your plan A and, and there is no plan B, that we are, in a sense, part of your plan A because we have the living breath of Jesus in us. And so may we lean in on you. May our response be that of of leaning in with our ears to hear how you are working in so many different and maybe uncomfortable ways. That when it comes to language and cultures and other different perspectives, Lord, that you have not, you have not abandoned even those that maybe we even disagree with, that you're right there in the middle of it, working, because that's what you did at Pentecost. You sent your Holy Spirit not to bring death, but to bring life. Lord, humble ourselves so we are not a complaining people. But Lord, that we would look to your promise. And so as we lean into you, Lord, we ask that you would bless us and keep us, smile at us, be gracious to us, give us your peace today and every day, and give us a great Memorial Day weekend in Jesus' name. Amen.
this week. He loves you. Have a great week.